I'm in my bag. So soft and so tender. Daddy in the kitchen, and he told me, son, listen. He said, you don't have to play the part that they wrote for you. You don't have to play. Hello, everyone. I'm Rich Robbins. Welcome to episode five of Soft and Tender, where each week we explore black fatherhood through conversations between the sons that they've raised. Our goal is to highlight the unique and universal aspects of love in black families, showcasing how these fathers express love and care despite societal challenges, along with broadening our understanding of what fatherhood means and how that meaning can evolve. Before we dive into this week's discussion, let me introduce our guests this week. To my left, we have Sam Thousand, artist and curator. Directly to my right, we've got Matthew Brewer, founder of Grasshopper Club and entrepreneur. And to my far right, we've got my brother Olu, proud owner of Progression. Fellas, hello. How you doing? Hello. I'm hello. great, I'm great, I'm great. Welcome Beautiful. to the show. Thank you for being a part of this. Thanks for having, uh, thanks for having us. I wanna just kick things off real quick by, um, by having you guys explain just a little bit of who your primary father figure was growing up and maybe just a fact about that person that many people don't know. All right, so Olu, we'll kick things off to you. For sure, yeah, so I'm the son of uh, Fred, a Nigerian uh, immigrant, um, and I think uh, one of the things that you know most inspired me a lot about him is uh, my love for research stems from him, um, hmm. and it started when I was really, really young, but he said something to me uh, one day, and I asked him a question about like, you know, where do ants go? <laughs> Um, <laughs> Where do they like go? in the winter time or whatever and he looked at me it was being very serious and said I don't buy internet for fun like get on a computer and google it <laughs> and like I remember that being such a significant portion and, and it like, kind of like led um, you know that what the relationship between me and my father looked like where um, research is kind of at the center of it um, um, and when you know who I am you understand what research means to me as well so yeah uh, that's beautiful it also sounds like something my dad would, would say, say as well it sounds like something my father would say <laughs> of yeah, course yeah. I don't pay for this internet for no reason yeah. <laughs> Matthew how about you well uh, the internet didn't exist when I was growing up <laughs> <laughs> um, I would kind of split the question in two so my biological father uh, was part of my childhood in the beginning. Mm. Um, and then we had some separation. And then after that separation, he passed away in, mm. when he was in his early 50s. Okay. Um, but I will say he was high school educated. He was the most confident man in the world. Mm. Uh, and uh, no matter what room we walked in, maybe it was irrationally based, but he always was confident. And, and to be a confident black man in the world uh, is, a, is a big mm. uh, feat. Yeah. And then I, I also had a couple coaches who really stepped in and played a father figure role for me in ways that really define who I am. Yeah. Uh, these are basketball coaches. One of my best friends, fathers, took me in as a son as well. So, uh -huh. so it's, it was sort of the combination of my biological father figure and then uh, others who really just had the heart and the vision to bring in others as their, their, their sons as well. Yeah, that's a beautiful thing to be able to experience fatherhood through through other men that aren't necessarily biologically connected to you. 100%, yeah. Oh, that's great. Sam, how about you? Yes, my primary father figure was my stepfather. He came into my life when I was three years old. Um, and we didn't have much of a, a great relationship growing up, uh, but there were times where we did kind of bond and it was with the stars. He, he worked um, for NASA for like 15 years. Wow. And um, so there'd be times where, you know, he'd be out back, you know, smoking a cigarette and I'll mm -hmm. step out there to maybe ask a question or something and we'll just hang for a little bit and we'll talk about what we're looking at, you wow. know. And uh, so he was really big in uh, astronomy and um, yeah. and yeah, that, that kind of sparked some interest um, in my adulthood. Ah, that's yeah. beautiful, yeah. that's beautiful, wow. Um, so for me, I am the son of Kano Robinson, uh, that's mm -hmm. my, my biological father. Um, Fun fact about him, uh, one, he is from uh, Southwest Philadelphia, and uh, he was a, a, a multi-accomplished athlete. So he did uh, indoor and outdoor track, he did football, he did cross country, he did bowling, <laughs> raw, you know, a young black man in Philly doing bowling. Um, he was also, I believe, Dad, correct me if I'm wrong, back at the crib, mm -hmm. uh, I believe he was the president of the National Honor Society in his school. Um, and so, you know, from a young age, he was accomplished, you know, and one thing that I've always appreciated about my pops is how 
humble he is uh, in, in front of his accomplishments. You know, he's the type of person that if he cooks a really good meal and I'm like, dad, thank you for the meal. He'd be like, well, thank, uh, thank your mom for going to get the groceries type of thing, you know? Um, and so, you know, as, as I'm putting the, together these, uh, these questions for you all today, thinking about like, what do, what do all these guys have in common, you know? Um, and one thing that, you know, and, the, and some of y'all I've had very brief interactions with, but this stands out to me is how humility is a, an important part for y'all in, in, in the face of your successes, yeah. right? And so uh, my question for you is, how has your relationship with your fathers or father figures shaped how you approach humility with your accomplishments and your success? Um, Sam, I'll, I'll, bounce, I'll bounce that question to you first. Yeah, um, my relationship with my, my stepfather growing up was a, a bit of a struggle was because he was very tough on me. Um, but he was all about like, you know, work. He was all about the work, you yeah. know, doing the work, you know, not doing a, a half job, you know what I'm saying? Completing the work, you know. And um, of course, I appreciate that now more. But as a, as a young kid, you know, especially in my <laughs> very young ages, you know, he was very tough. But it really showed me how... Um, you know, just 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 one small win is just a small win, and you got to keep going. There's there's more to go, um, and so I I think that really kind of kept me um, humble and 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 moving with humility. Um, but then also just understanding that there's a there's a bigger picture, you know, and and um, and not just getting so caught up at you know look what I did, you know, and it was more about like you're supposed to do that, you know, you're supposed yeah. to take care of take the trash out and you know whatever like little small things, you know, growing up. Um, but then that just kind of have just grown into, um, you know, being able to widen the scope, you know, when it comes to big projects or, or big, um, big things that I've done, you know, through my artistry or just uh, in life. Um, these accom accomplishments are still, they're big, but they're also still a drop in a bucket and there's still more. True. There's still more work to be done. I, I can appreciate that a lot. Mm -hmm. Putting in a thousand percent effort in everything yeah. that you do as a as a shorty, that's like that's a hard thing to to, yeah, to grasp, man. you know. Because especially <laughs> when I see my friends slacking and they playing video games, I'm like, how come I can't just be a kid, you know? Yeah. But now in my adult life, I get it, you know. Yeah. I get it. Work ethic uh, goes a long way. And in yes. a, in a lot of ways, maybe yeah. we're all sitting here today because that was instilled in in, in us, you know. Um, Olu, how about you? Yeah. Um. I mean, if I'm being honest, um, when I think about like growing up, especially like with my pops, um. Like, it wasn't really anything that was kind of needed to be said when it comes to like humility. It was kind of just something that I just saw our entire family move with. Mm -hmm. um, so as proud as Nigerian people can be, um, that proudness has to stem from like the culture and not about the things that you do, because um, it's kind of like the expectation. Um, and so like, yeah, when I think about like the humility of my father um, and I think about um, like the expectations that were kind of set, it was one of those things where my father, he spent a lot of time like driving a taxi cab to like pay the bills and so on and so forth and never you know complained about anything and kind of just like always made sure that um if I'm, if he wasn't around to parent that making sure everything else was taken care of and everything was paid for and so on and so forth um and so like that's just something that kind of rubs off on me but i will say the nice thing about growing up um and like that is like the older i get the more he is uh willing to also acknowledge the work that i put in and so i remember mm -hmm. One of the nicest messages I ever had gotten from him, um, one of his favorite uh, um, comedians is, um, what's the word, uh, Trevor Noah. Right. So when Trevor was in Chicago, I surprised him with tickets to nice. the Trevor Noah concert. And I remember him just saying like, yo, like, it was cool to see Trevor Noah, but the coolest thing about the trip is as a taxi cab, drive, as a taxi cab driver, um, being able to visit the Chicago theater um, and see the inside at some, wow. as, as someone who only is only able to see the outside dropping off his you know wealthy customers um, was everything for him, right? And so it's like that vulnerability is something he didn't really show a lot yeah. growing up, and he becomes he's becoming a little bit more um, vulnerable um, the older we get, and so like. I don't know if that like also kind of leads to like that humility question, but um, I think those are just kind of like some of the lessons that he's taught me in, in general, especially around that I idea of humility. No, yeah. definitely. And it yeah. seems like humility was more so shown rather yeah. than told in your house. Yeah, so, exactly. 100%. Yeah. And I, I think in a Nigerian home, and I think that's why I'm also really excited because I'm like, I want to talk about like Nigerian fatherhood. Yeah. Um, and I think one of the biggest things about that is there's, there's a lot of unsaid things that's kind of just expected. Um, and I think that that is a benefit, but I also do think that's a little bit of a drawback. And we can get into that a little bit more uh -huh. as we kind of talk more. Yeah. Oh, I feel that. Yeah. I feel that. Wow. Matt, any of these uh, resonating with your own story? Yeah, I mean, Olu's point, uh, you know, my father, my biological father, uh, 
he worked in a factory every morning from four to noon. Now it's a shift. Um, my mom worked super hard as well. And when you grow up in a household where both your parents are working and giving everything they can, yeah. there's just a humility that you inherit yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. just from that alone. Um, the other thing I would say, you know, my father passed away unexpectedly. Mm -hmm. uh, another uh, coach who I considered a father figure passed away unexpectedly. And this idea that things can change in a heartbeat mm. is the most humbling thing mm. to me. Like, yeah. as amazing as this moment might be, it could change in the, in the next moment. Yeah. Uh, and, and so there's an element of not taking that for granted mm. uh, and, and staying humble about it all. My mother was also a father to me yeah. uh, in yeah. a very big way. Speak on it, bro. In a very Come big on. way. Yeah. Uh, and it was the hardest working person I, I, I've ever met who was never asked for anything in return. Mm. So that's yeah. part of it, too. Yeah. No, that's I. I'm glad that you said that. <laughs> I'm glad you said that because I don't you're not the only one that has experienced that, I don't think, you know, and I think that that gives language for other people to certainly like feel seen in yeah. that, you know, um, in a lot of ways, I think, you know, I, I come from a lot of uh, very strong women, you know, and, and, and that strength is seen in, in a very versatile range of characteristics and qualities, you know, um, and so I think that there are a lot of like traditional father elements that the women in my life express, yep. you know, um, so I'm, I, I'm appreciative that you touch on that. Hi, I'm Darius Hillman. Joining me on the next edition of In the Arena, banking executive and agent of faith, Monica Rubio. I was strong. Hmm. I persevered in career and community. I realized I had lost myself. Join the conversation Tuesday at 7 p.m. on Can TV Cable Channel 19 and streaming on CanTV.org and the Can TV Plus app. Experience the power of community television. I'm in my bag. So soft and so tender. Uh, the other thing that I that I know about y'all is that y'all are great leaders. Um, you know, um, whether that's in the, on the music set, you know, side of things, or the clothing side of things, or um, you know, the business side of things. Do y'all feel like that you are effective leaders because of or in spite of your fathers? Both. Both. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, we, we learn from those around us and, and, and also carry baggage. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I think we all probably have some kind of baggage from our childhood just by virtue of, you know, growing up the way we did. Yeah. Um, I have a coach who's a phenomenal leader of men and the compassion, the empathy, meeting people where they're at uh, and knowing that um, everyone's always going through something and being able to meet them where they're at uh, is something I took from them. Mm. Um, but then, you know, there's certain things that my father, some of the tension that we had over the years, some of the resentment uh, was because of me disagreeing with how he carried himself or approached certain things. Yeah. Uh, and so as a person and leader, I model myself to be better than that. Yeah. So it's a little bit of both. Yeah. Okay. And I want to double back on, on your leadership in particular, because I know that you, you lead a lot of people for sure. <laughs> you know, um, Olu, how about you? How is, how is leadership? I mean, yeah, I think it's the same, same thing, right? It's yeah. both. Uh, I think to answer this question, it goes back to what you were saying about your mother, right? Um, I think I be, be learned how to become a leader because of my mother. Um, and I'm sure there was some role that like my father did play in that. Um, but like I would say my mom was the, like, when I thought about the type of leader I wanted to be, it was always more so from like the lens of my mother. Huh. Um, but then like, I th and I don't want to necessarily say in spite because I think one of the pitfalls of just being a Nigerian father is like you inherit the culture um, and so you inherit like the parenting styles that you know may have worked you know years and years ago but yeah. you know they weren't right then so they're definitely not right now yeah. um, and so that that, that that um importance of speaking with your kids and hanging out and so on and so forth right for my father was just like as, I'm, as long as i'm paying the bills and my kids is taken care of i'm doing my job yeah. right and so it's like for me that wasn't necessarily leadership and yeah, my mom is the one who kind of like did all of that but i will say like i also realized what type of leader i wanted to be because like I was looking for certain things from my father that I didn't necessarily get. Mm -hmm. um, I want to give as much grace to him as possible because like I know like parenting is hard and like when you're coming from a different country and trying to like you know adjust and assimilate and all that type of stuff um, it's kind of hard to let go of certain things and so like I don't blame him um, for anything as much as I'm just like the lack of also showed me where I wanted to pour and grow in. Yeah, so, no, that makes a lot of sense and that's a uh, 
that's a very compassionate perspective to mm -hmm. have, you know, and one that I hope that people are hearing back at home, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, looking at somebody's flaws and being like, you are, you're a human. Yes. That's why you did that, yeah. you know, um, and you didn't do it out of maliciousness. Exactly. Right. And so I can I can now I can take that and I can I can be the I can fill in that void for yes. other folks. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Sam, how about you? Man, I just got to say that whole you you're human like. Um, mm -hmm that time where we realize that our parents are just human. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, that's a uh, big, 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 big moment. <laughs> I'm like, you weren't born this way? Right. You were also a kid at one point? You weren't yeah. born as my dad? Oh, right. yeah. You're trying to figure it out just like we all are, exactly. right? Like, um, man, this is a really good question, though, because I, during the pandemic, of course, a lot of us had a lot of time to just think mm -hmm. and, and sit with ourselves. Um, so I was raised by my, my stepfather primarily, but my my father, my biological father, who I'm his namesake, um, I would see him like sparingly growing up and then I, I became a little bit closer to him like as I became an adult. Um, and I had to sit with myself and see if there were some times where I felt that I was moving in spite of. But I, after some meditation and prayer and just really just sitting with myself, I realized that I, I couldn't find it. I couldn't find where there was a time. I think it was all because of. Um, huh. I, I think the. I think the leadership and the the love that was shown through leadership and. Um, I I think it all just pushed me and I and I think that everything all the lessons that I learned through my fathers and my father figures, were all um, nourishing. Uh -huh. I feel like they all were nourishing. I feel like I never felt like, I feel like when I, when I think in spite of, like, I feel like I'm going to show you, you know, or I'm going to prove it, you know what I'm saying, because you don't think so or because I can't receive this from you, you know. And, um, yeah, I just don't, I, I feel like I was such a little nice little boy <laughs> at the time, you know what I'm saying, where it was just like I, I didn't, I, I just went back to my room and created, you know, I was a creator yeah. at seven, you know what I'm saying, yeah. and so I just got lost in music and my d dual tape decks, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> and I remember asking myself that and I couldn't yeah. find it. Dang, dang. Ah, wow. Yeah, you got me thinking a, a, a lot about uh, just the, the humanity of it all, really. Um, so thank you, bro. Thank you. I want to touch a little bit about uh, success, right? And how success has kind of evolved for us over time. Each of y'all are very, very successful in your respective fields, right? Um, how was success, and, and again, this is through the lens of, of Pops, right? How was success defined in the household when you were growing up versus how it evolved and how you embrace it today? Um, Sam, why don't, we, why don't we bounce that over to you? Yeah. Um, it was so, so I grew up with, with four, uh, it was four kids, so three siblings. Um, so we were a rather large family, it was six of us total. Um, and I feel like when you grow up with, with, with that many siblings, at least, you know, even more, like you really are trying to, you, you want your voice to be heard. You're trying to stand out you know, and you're, and you're, and you innately start off by figuring out who you are and, and what makes you special and different within the family. I was, I was highly accomplished in music. I, I, I started when I was seven. Um, when, by the time I got to high school, I was winning all of these awards and, and I got a, my, actually my last conversation with my mom was like, Hey, I got this box full of trophies, you know, like, what do you want me to do with these? You know? And I was like, well, I, I took pictures of them the last time. And she was like, well, I'm gonna keep them. I'm gonna hold on yeah. to them. <laughs> but growing up, it was kind of like, those things weren't really celebrated. You know, yeah. I was known, I was like homecoming king at, in high school, you know what I'm saying? I was like very celebrated in school, but it, back home, it, it wasn't about the accomplishments. Yeah. It wasn't about the trophies and the awards. They stayed in my room, you know what I'm saying, with me. Okay. Um, and, oh, they, they actually were in the living room too, I, yeah. <laughs> um, but I, I, I think that it was really about just being a man mm -hmm. and being responsible mm -hmm. and I think that though a lot of my drive came in in like the, the art and the craft and like you know um being creative and being a leader within the, the the school system and I went to this really like um dope you know state renowned um 
high school with a dope marching band that just swapped competitions all the time. Mm. So it was just, I was like so in that world, you know. And I grew up in Houston, Texas, so like marching band is just huge. Um, I do have to say that my band director, because of this, my band director and I became, he was like a second father figure for me. Mm. And because I didn't have the best relationship growing up with my stepfather, the person that I saw the most was my band director. And that was a person that, that I learned what trust felt like mm. for the first time from, mm. uh, from an adult male who was a mentor to me because he, he gave me that, yeah. you know what I'm saying? Wow. Um, so I do have to shout him out. He's on my altar at home. Like he will forever, mm. Ronald B. Thornton, he'll forever, uh, you know, be special hey. to me, you know. I'm Sean Taylor, inviting you to join me each week on the Can TV original series, Hustle, Play, Love. Let's ignite your passions, whether it's in your career, your business, your personal or romantic life. Join the conversation Tuesday at 7.30 p.m. on Can TV Cable Channel 19 or stream live on CanTV.org or on the Can TV Plus app. Experience the power of community television. Growing up, child of Nigerian immigrants, you only got three real choices. Medical school, <laughs> doctor, or engineer. You know what I mean? So like, um, while my father was never explicit in, in telling me what he wanted me to be growing up, uh, my mother certainly was. And, you know, mom and dad are a unit, so it's kind of just like, <laughs> you got to do what she say. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, growing up, like, uh, you know, I was like the golden boy, kind of like what you were saying, right? Stayed out of trouble, getting mm -hmm. good grades. And for me, you know, that's what success was uh, defined as in my household, right? As long as you stayed out of trouble, you was on a honor roll, and you got into a good school, like, you'll be fine. Yeah. Um, and I think like the older I get, um, the more like success is redefined for me, um, where it's like, you should be looking for trouble, <laughs> right? Like that's, that's where success is like, you know, looking for trouble um, and like not doing things the way that society says you should do them, but like quite literally trying to do the opposite. Yeah. Um, and so seeing mm -hmm. my parents um, and my dad even in particular um, come around um, when uh, I started my business and my brand um, and seeing like how much they were just like, you know, when I quit my investment consulting job, my dad being like, what you doing? What's going on? <laughs> you, you, you sure? Yeah. I'm like, yeah, right? Um, but having that confidence in myself to say that like, Y'all's definition of success gave me the framework I needed to navigate through the world, but I realized that that's not my definition of success. Yeah. Um, and so I'm going to take those tools, but do it my way. Yeah. Um, and so now my dad, like, you know, when I was starting my brand, I, maybe I'm three years old, three years in, he'll send me like a, a YouTube video on like, you know, how to start a clothing or a yes. t-shirt business, right? So Love like, um, finally coming around, I would say now for me, um, the way I define success um, isn't even about the accomplishments anymore. Um, it goes back to like, just like value system, because the older I get, the more I realize that that's all we actually truly have is our value system. Yeah. Can I put my head on my pillow every night and be happy with the person that I was that day, right? Not Come not on. how many t-shirts I sold, not how mm -hmm. much you know, I did in revenue, but like, can I actually stomach the person in, in the mirror, right? Yeah. Um, and that's how I define success for myself today. Yeah, that's great. Uh, for me, it's definitely evolved. Uh, growing up, it was, you know, I saw my parents struggle at times and I wanted to do better than that. Mm. And that was success. Yes. Mm. Um, and then uh, I got into college, I went to Stanford. Uh, and I remember when I first got in, that moment in high school when I got that admission, I remember thinking, okay, there's a new floor to my opportunities. Mm -hmm. if, I, I'll, if I go to this school and get a degree from here, I'll at least have a safety net of this degree that will provide some, like, downside protection mm. right and that became the new goal uh, mm. is to uh, risk management and to make sure that no matter what I do uh, have enough of a foundation so that even if things go wrong I have something to fall mm. back on yeah. and control the downside yeah and then along the way uh, started getting more opportunities and, and evolving a little bit and realizing that that's a noble way to think, I, I, but uh, it would be a disservice if I didn't really think about maximizing upside. Mm. But mentally, that conversion from saying, I want to make sure there's a safety net here to protect me, kept me from thinking about swinging for the, the mm. fence. Yeah. Mm. Uh, instead of trying to avoid falling, it kept me from 
thinking about really jumping and leaping. Oh. Uh, and so that mental shift probably took place, you know, in the last five to 10 years. Yeah. Um, and then now it's evolved even more into, uh, you know, bigger than myself and, and building a platform uh, that allows me to partner with people and companies, organizations, communities that actually value. And so you can look yourself in the mirror and, yeah. uh, and, have, and there's a freedom that comes with that. Yes, uh, that, that you know, it's, it's not something you get taught in school. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This freedom yeah. is sort of, in some ways for me, the opposite of solving for the downside. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, wow. And so yeah. that journey is still a journey ongoing, uh, but has been, has unlocked a lot for me. Yeah. Man, and you know, one thing that I'll say about all of y'all is that y'all really do swing for the fences, <laughs> for real. And y'all be hitting home runs. <laughs> y'all be hitting them home runs too. Uh, and so thank you for, for, for speaking on that too, because I think that the idea of the safety net um, sometimes can be a little bit overbearing to, mm -hmm. to our accomplishments and what we want to accomplish in life. You know, um, that's something that I think I'm experiencing in my life right now uh, is that that kind of like I'm on the precipice of like, do I just take this leap finally and, and, and just do it? And there's not necessarily there's not necessarily a precedent in my family, you know, for what I want to do. Um, but I do have that value system though for my family, you know, and for me, I'm like, I just need to trust the value system that it has, it has provided the foundation that I can take this, this leap and swing for the fences for 100%, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, thank you all, uh, for, for being a part of this conversation. Um, real quick, if we could just do, uh, one or two words about what you want folks at home leaving with, uh, knowing about black fatherhood or what, what you just want them to know about black fatherhood in particular. We'll go Sam, Olu, and, and with Matt. Black fatherhood is, is tough. Um, but, um, and, and yeah, I, I mean, what, what comes to mind is that it's tough and but, but black fathers got, they got swag, man. They got a, they got a certain type of vibe to them that is about, um, about their business, but it's about, uh, there's character and there's, um, there's tone in it. My <laughs> father's got swag, yes sir. Um, I would actually say, mine's would be like a, an ask, which is like, or a reminder that like, kind of like with, with the title of the show, right? Like, black father, you're, you're allowed to be soft and tender with your sons, um, and I encourage it in, in, in fact, because like, yeah, we need, more tenderness um, amongst black men in general. <clears throat> um, and I think that like fathers are, black fathers are the ones who can instill it at an early age. Um, so like, yeah, remind your son, sons that it's okay to hug each other and it's okay to say good morning to yeah. another man when you're walking past them in the street, right? Um, yeah, just like be soft and tender with your kids. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, agree with both. The only thing I would add is uh, sort of the conversation we were having before, which I think is, Black fatherhood can come in lots of different forms. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously there's our biological fathers, there's father figures, there's coaches, there's mothers, there's a million different people who have helped shape the fatherhood experience or guidance that I've received over the years. Mm. And with that, <laughs> fatherhood is beautifully vast. It can span from biological relation to chosen family like Matthew's talking about. Black fatherhood is particularly beautiful. It's had to endure generations of misunderstanding and mislabeling. We hope this conversation shed some light and brought more insight to your own relationships at home. Thank you for tuning in to our Soft and Tender world today. Continue the conversation by following us at Soft and Tender series on Instagram and TikTok and subscribe to our YouTube channel at Soft and Tender. And so next time, I'm Rich Robbins. Good night. He said, you don't have to play the part that they wrote for you. You don't have to play the part. I'm like, how he do that twice? Why that boy so nice? Why he cuff the mic like a baby bite? So, so, so soft and tender. Betty like that in any weather. Betty only bite if he's Don't get it twisted. I be in the gym ready to box. Why would I not? Niggas out here creeping hard on the block. My pops taught me if you can't win the fight with your brain, you could definitely throw it.